we have Saskia today to, to talk with us about uh, uh, global street and what is happening on the global street and what is happening on the streets around the globe and why is it so global, but also about the changes in, in capitalism that we've been experiencing over the last two or three decades. So we'll start with Saskia. Once again, please join me in welcoming Saskia Sassen. I want to talk a bit about some of the stuff that I'm researching, share with you some of my thoughts about politics. Uh, I'm going to bring in, I know this is about Europe, uh, and I am actually European, I'm Dutch. I grew up in Latin America, so I'm a bit Latin American too. But uh, I, I am living now in the United States, and I think the United States is an extreme case. Uh, of all the possible abuses that a supposedly lawful system can do. And in being extreme, it really illuminates certain things. So I hope that you have patience with me and uh, as I present some of these data about the US. Some of what I talk about, of course, is way, way beyond the U.S. Um, the, the concept of the global street is, is for me, uh, uh, I've sort of, as I was struggling with the, the emergence of what I think of as these very large systematicities. I don't want to say system, but it is something that crawls and that embeds itself in the routines of daily life, in the routines of political systems, in the routines of courts, in the routines of the informal aspect of our daily life. And there are multiple ones. It's not one evil enemy, though finance is pretty close to that, I must say, there is one evil enemy. But a lot of this stuff is actually diffused, distributed. And, um, and, and so the question for me became, what are the spaces where those without power without access to the formal instruments of power, can actually make a history, make a piece of the political peace, as in pedazo, as in peace. And not peace, but peace. Is that clear, that difference? So it's not about peacefulness, it's about, you know, stuff. And so, so I came up with this notion of the global street, clearly inspired by Tahrir Square and by the courage of so many other groups that were less successful perhaps, uh, even though the success of Tahrir Square was also limited clearly. Um, and I was thinking of the Occupy movements. Occupying is hard work. It's very different from demonstrations. You have to make a new territory in a way. And, uh, and so I, I began to think, is there a space? Is there a space that is partly a, a subjective notion huh? and partly very concrete, very territorial, very grounded, uh, which is not so dominated by formal systems? And inevitably, when things of the European tradition of uh, public space, which is important, but it's also a space in a way for ritualized practices with embedded codes. And I wanted something rougher, something not, and so I, I should say the piazza, the boulevard, you know, those are those spaces of the European imaginary, which of course were spaces mostly of the bourgeoisie, but you know, in a way they, they went beyond that. And, and there was something interesting in the constituting of a public, the public. Uh, and in a way, when you think the version in our cities, I don't know how much traffic you have of people, etc., at rush hour in, uh, in Zagreb or other cities, but there are many cities in the world where early in the morning when the people go to work or when they come back, it's a mad rush of people. And what I wanted to capture, what interested me in this sort of, uh, you know, this, this thinking, that I was doing about what is that space? What do I call that space? It just struck me how in the center of a city when people are rushing and they bump each other and they step on each other's foots and they rip your button off, whatever. There is a code. You don't take it personally. 
It's, and, and in a way, that's a capability that we can understand, we who don't know each other, we who are anonymous to each other, we who sort of, you know, we understand, no, you don't take it personally. Whereas if it happened in the neighborhood or in a little village, hey, you would take offense. It would be an act almost of aggression. It would change the, the same material practice, bumping, you stepping on your foot, changes meaning. And so I began to think about capabilities, urban capabilities that allow masses of people, if you want, to somehow recognize the code, partly recognize because it's happening in space, in urban space. And, and then, of course, inevitably, I, I thought about Tahrir Square. And in one way or another, with all the ups and downs, for vast stretches of time, it was extraordinary how a bunch of people in tents staying day after day after day constituted a kind of block, blocking of the tanks and I don't know what all. You know, what is it about urban space that enables that possibility? Or when you think of asymmetric war, Nowadays, when a conventional army goes to war, the, the chances are that the enemy is, as they put it kindly, an irregular combatant. And what the consequence of that is, is that it urbanizes war. So the space of the city becomes actually a critical technology for war on the part of the irregular combatant. If you can draw that conventional army into the city, you are in a, in a stronger position. What is it about the city? Those conventional armies have huge bombs. The United States, when it bombed Iraq, could have just dropped one of its big bombs and destroyed the whole of Baghdad, so to say. But it didn't. What is it about the city? So these were the kinds of, of uh, questions you know, that led me to... to to this notion of the global street, a rough space, a space that is not about ritualized practices and existing codes. We need those spaces too, I'm not putting them down, but we need also a space that is not that kind of space because this is a time of unstable meanings. This is a time that I personally, I don't know people in the room, think of as a massive, frontal, brutal attack on our humanity, a brutal attack on our possibility to, to have reasonable lives, a brutal violation of the social contract that is supposedly part of liberal democracy. There were better times for liberal democracy. I'm just talking about the traditional notion of liberal democracy. So it seems to me that to understand what are the spaces for making, for making the political, for making another history becomes really... Uh, a question almost of survival and a necessity becomes a political project. So in that sense, the global street as a space that is not about ritualized practices, uh, that is not about recognizable codes embedded in urban space, but a space for making, making new instruments, making a new history. Now, I, I, um, I am condemned to being an academic. I'm an activist too, but I mean, with the way I think, the way I speak, the way I will speak to you tonight, it, it has a, I like to bring in data, can you believe this, in a theater here, uh, graphs, tables, because I think there's a lot of stuff that captures, you know, some of these new trends, and so I want to talk in those, in those terms. And so, a first point in terms of how one produces an explanation, an analysis, an interpretation, is for me something that I feel as a necessity for any of us who are uh, doing this kind of research, this kind of work, and, and wh where we are subject to, you know, disciplining conditions for thinking, for using data, for interpreting data. I, I, need, uh, I need a little playing space before I throw myself into the purely academic. And, and I, for me, one, one sort of uh, set of practices that I do in this playing space is what I call analytic tactics. And I mean it literally. 
and another way of putting it is tactical analysis. Not an analysis that pretends to have the truth and to see the way it really is, no. A tactical analysis, analysis that wants to get at something, that wants to uncover something that is now in the shadows, that wants to pull up elements that are not part of dominant narratives. And it seems to me that that is part of the political project of this period, of this current moment. One of the first of these analytic tactics is to think of all the basic building blocks, whether of the very powerful, or of the medium powerful, of the good, of the bad, as they are made. The making of, as you see there. And uh, if it is made, it can be unmade. And I want to apply this notion of making to very abstract notions like inequality. Inequality is made. It isn't just a consequence of or a function of, as is often said. And justice is made. And injustice is also made. Now, clearly, this is an extreme version, but this is an analytic tactics. I'm not aiming to be uh, objective and truthful. I have trouble with those notions anyhow. This is what I mean by analytic, uh, by analytic tactics. I want to position me vis-a-vis -vis whatever I want to understand in a way that helps me see something. And that entails a provocation. Next slide. And here are three, I don't know that I'm going to get to all of them, but I hope that will shape what I want to tell you about. So the first one is uh, this, this a need. I think we need to do that. And this is what I think the Occupy movements are doing in a very interesting way, is to destabilize, actively destabilize meanings that have become stable. No meaning is forever stable. But they gain a certain stability. You know, there was a, when the Soviet Union was the dominant sort of shaping force in many of these regions, there was a kind of stability to what the state meant, what the economy meant, what it meant to have a family, what, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with the Keynesian period in the United States. And, and you can repeat that, of course, for other parts of the world and for other epochs. I'm just mentioning these two because they're still close by. I think the last 30 years have seen, and in some parts of the world, it's the last 20 years, have seen a process of active destabilizing of meanings that had become a bit stable. And so in my research and interpretation and theorization practice, I think that's enormously important. I want to actively destabilize meanings. And you will see that I do that as I proceed. Um, Another one that I have here is right. We deal with a lot of very powerful categories. The economy, global finance, society, poverty, inequality, etc. Discrimination, neoliberalism. Now, th these are all words, but they're words that are, are full of content. You know, you say the word discrimination, and it's almost like it's an invitation to stop thinking. Because it says so much, especially in a country like the United States, you know, where there is a lot of discrimination and people are continuously talking about it. Same thing with inequality. You know, it just loses the blot that is part of the story of inequality. And, um, and so, so I have come to see that for me it really works when confronted by a very powerful explanation, by a master category, I, I, you can't throw it out. You can't throw simply out and say, oh, out with it. No, you can't. Because a powerful explanation is a collective production. It comes, you know, you can't just say, oh, I don't like it, like some of my lazy students say, oh, no, I don't want to deal with it. No. You've got to deal with it. So how do I deal with it? I, I don't throw it out the window. But I ask myself, my first move is always not to surrender, to say, oh, yes, no. It is to ask, what is it hiding precisely because it is so powerful? You understand the difference, right? So it's like, I mean, just to make it clearer, uh, it's the proverbial image of dark street at night, very sharp light, strong circle of light, the stronger that light, the more you see everything that is inside the circle, 
and the more difficult it is to see what is happening in the shadows around that circle. That's a powerful explanation. It both allows you to see a lot of stuff, but it also blinds you to all kinds of other things. So my zone for research, for interpretation, for theorization, is the shadow, the penumbra, around powerful explanations. And that means that you're forever engaged with whatever that powerful explanation that, that probably uh, dominates understanding of what is happening. Um, the final one, and that's of course something that has to do with territory, and, and that is something that certainly this region has extraordinary histories of making territories and of unmaking territories. Um, in my own work, uh, I, I am sort of, I, in different phases, I obsess about different things. Right now, one of my uh, real sort of obsessions is a question of territory. And that is why the Occupy movements have engaged me. And that is why I want to find a category like the global strait. Now, territory is actually a complex event. It is collectively made. Think of national territory uh, or contested you know, autonomies like Catalonia, or you certainly have histories of that in, in this whole region. Those territories have embedded complex histories, antagonisms, victories, uh, reivindications. Territory is not land, territory is not earth, it is not ground, it is not space, it is not terrain. Territory is something that is much more than that. Think of national sovereign territory. I mean, it's an extraordinarily powerful, complex condition. Now, I, for instance, work also on, on, uh, on, on the territory of global finance, which is partly an electronic territory. I think a lot of the, ter the territory of global civil society is also a subjectivity that is evoked by the fact of digital technologies and that possible, even if they're not online, you know. So the question of territory, I'm trying to expand the meaning. Now, in my interpretation of what has happened is that freeing up, liberating the category territory from its sort of historically now ensconced meaning of national sovereign territory is actually very useful to see other conditions. And so this is one of the things that I am, I am really dealing with. And so territory, so one of my other projects that I'm doing now is what happens when territory exits conventional framings? And the conventional framing right now is a national state. What happens if I free up this extraordinary category that reveals all these histories, also the histories of the powerless, if you want. If I free it up and I take it out of this, in, this, this uh, embeddedness in the national state sovereign territory notion and allow it to work analytically, because territory has taken a very long siesta, a long nap for 300 years or more. It, it has been flattened into one meaning. And the meaning is national sovereign territory. And so th these are the kinds of things that I'm interested in. Now, in, in one of my research projects, for instance, I look at when China, and this is not to hit on China, by the way, because it's all kinds of other buys. When, when China buys three million hectares in Congo or in Zambia to grow palm for biofuels, in other words, plantation, what happens? It evicts, it expels floras, faunas, hundreds of villages, many rural manufacturing districts, many smallholder agriculture. And then it has a transformed condition that we call a plantation. You know the term plantation, right? Which it really is an alteration. Is that still? territory, national territory of Zambia, or is it something else? The global city, something that I sort of uh, was discovering, you know, when I was looking at, global, at the global economy and I asked myself, does the global economy ever hit the ground? Is it all floating up there, you know, between nations? 
And so the global city, which is a critical space for global finance, but also, mind you, for the struggles of the powerless, very important that both of them are there. The global city is a kind of, is not like a plantation, but it has the same sort of effect of creating a whole, a structural whole. Whole, not as in whole, but as in whole, agujero in Spanish, for those of you who might know Spanish, um, un trou in French, uh, in that tissue of national sovereign territory. A lot of what we still call national sovereign territory today is an absolutely denationalized territory that is controlled by neoliberal dynamics, etc. I don't think that denationalizing national territory is all bad. There are very interesting propositions. So arriving at the global street, what the Occupy movement does, unlike a demonstration for a weekend, is make territory. And Tahir Square worked so incredibly confronted with massive forces, because by camping there, by making a living, by taking care of the functions of food, of the functions of order, of health, of everything that had to be taken care of, they made territory. And so I want to bring in uh, real heavy sort of stuff to this notion of, uh, of making territory, of making the global street. And again, by making territory, I mean that one is embedding other histories, in this case, histories of reclamation, histories of critique, histories of contestation, in something that, you know, whatever might not be, might be something that really has been flattened into a barely a meaning. There is barely a meaning there left, you know, it's national sovereign territory. Now, um, I think the Occupy movements in, in the United States, Los Indignados in Spain, uh, you know, the, the kinds of things in Latin America, you have had Occupy movements as well. These are all extraordinary uh, projects because besides making territory, they're also making a new version of the social. And the fact that it, so much of it happens on the street is also extraordinary. So, for instance, as a footnote, in the United States, uh, a lot of the old lefty sort of mindset, you know, which really believes in having a party, in having a program, in having a plan, I don't disagree with that either, but so they, they have put down this Occupy movement as saying nothing, it leaves without a trace, nothing. I think that's incorrect. I think that the Occupy movement is a very different type of project from the old left project. Mind you, I was old left. Huh? I became a communist at 13 when I was growing up in Latin America. So, and then I, I changed my mind a bit on that one. But, um, but recently, Eric Hobsbawm, I'm sure you know him, the historian, many of you, whose work I really admire, and I think he gets it right all the time, etc. But so I, we were discussing the Occupy movement. I, I see him a lot in London, and it was just him and me. And, uh, and he says, yeah, no party. It's like dismissing it. I disagree with that. I disagree with that notion. I think what the Occupy movements are doing is besides that making of territory with all that that entails, that also enables them to make parts of the social, a collectivizing of all kinds of things. They're also creating, if you want, a semantic space where a certain set of debates and discussions can happen. In a country like the United States, which is, I mean, nobody is on the left there in the formal political system. Even the, what I call the left, I means like center, you know, right, etc. Um, this has one little outcome, just to illustrate. This semantic space that was made has created the possibility of 70% of your American burgers, I don't mean this, the eat, yeah, the, the whatever, you know, you're sort of middle class, American middle class, who are polled, you know, polls, as polls when they ask you questions, I don't know whom they poll, I have never been polled in my 20 years of living there, um, said, this was in November, beginning of November, said, uh, yeah, there is too much inequality in this country, yeah, we should tax the millionaires. That is an achievement in the history of polling that starts after World War II in the United States. Never had that happen. I mean, inequality is like a bad word. Uh, 
taxing is another bad word. So these are little, now one might say, well, so what does that do? Well, that creates, that's a big opening. That is also a, a sort of, a, for me, part of this global street, you know, that it's partly a semantic space where a set of discussions can happen that otherwise don't happen. Now, I want to, to nail down a couple of things now. And so, uh, I, I want to talk a bit about what it means, because this is, a, this is a conceptual, analytic, and political practice that I think matters. And I want to illustrate it with a couple of very simple things that nail the meaning down, because I think we're all in a, in a process of trying to produce new analytic instruments of trying to re-narrate a lot of the stuff that is happening because it's a very extreme moment, I would say. And so I hope that this helps. So I want to illustrate it with the question of immigration. And so see it both, both on the question of substance, it matters, I think, but it really is a, it's like an illustration of an analytic tactic. Very simple, very elementary, little tactical move that produces a transformed representation. So the first slide, I think that is a slide that I have. So, spaces, immigration spaces. Rather than thinking the immigrant, think of spaces. A given person who is an immigrant can move across these spaces. I came to the United States when I was 18 as an illegal immigrant, and my first job was as a cleaning woman. And I know I came from a bourgeois family, it was partly history, partly adventure, so I don't want to dramatize. I'm not dramatizing, I'm just describing sort of, you know. And so I was a cleaning woman. Uh, that didn't last very long, by the way, because I really, the adventure went out of it very quickly. But, uh, and there were other women who were mostly Latin American women and, uh, and, and Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean women. None of us felt that we were Cleaning women, simply. The space flattened us, we do this all the time, into cleaning women. We were, this was a point in a trajectory. So just, now what I want to pull out of, and in fact, all of us moved on. Now, there is a lot of moving across spaces, right? But the point that I want to pull out is that here we were, truly powerless in many ways, truly poor, very poorly paid, very tiring work. You became ill easily because it was just you know, a certain kind of work. And yet, we all moved on. So I want to, to capture you know, this notion of the making of powerlessness, but also the making of trajectories, etc., that we can exit. Right now, those of us who are contesting, we have far less power in many conventional senses than the enormous powers that we are contesting, which are partly systems. We're not just dealing with individuals. If we eliminated the individuals, the system might still be there, partly at least. So to, when you track the stories of Hum people who enter in immigration space, you know, you can see it, it, sort of, it, it keeps hitting you in the face. Now, there are also very bad histories, and certainly the asylum-seeking regime is not a generous one. Next, or oh, the other, right, next slide. Remittances, actually I should not have shown it yet. So remittances is a, is a little word that has become a category. You say remittances today, what have you said? You have said, poor immigrants who come to our rich countries, and what do they do? They send their money back home. And so the notion is, you know, all these immigrants were sending money back home. Well, the usual way of doing it is that you look at the United States, Germany, France, whatever, and you look at where the poor countries are to which the immigrants sent money back. You take one little analytic shift and you just change the question a little. It's a cognate question, but it makes all the difference. So I asked, what are the main countries in the world receiving remittances? Well, the top five, in the top 10, there are five rich countries, and even the United States is in the top 20. Now, what are we picking up on here? We're picking up on professionals who are also sending remittances. Now, I use this as illustration because it means that these, this is analytic tactics. This is not method, this is not 
grant. No, you just stand back a lot. Now, when you then come back to this notion that I have that this is a epoch when stabilized meanings have become unstable, you know, there is a lot of uh, potentially productivity, you know, very productive thinking if you take these little analytic tactics. So about these powerful systems that make me ask the question, where are the spaces, the in-between spaces where we can constitute alternatives, where we have, you know, and that is why the, the Occupy movement is so interesting in that sense. So one, one of the critical dimensions that is affecting all of us, very few countries are escaping this, is a whole new zone, and I'm just looking at one part of this. I'm looking at the United States, Germany, and the UK, because, you know, there are limits to what I can do. And one way of describing it <coughs> is that it is a surveillance zone. It's transnational, by definition. It's passive. It's just surveying. The challenges are reduced to technicalities. By this I mean the back room, back room, the back door, the, no, the back room effect, anybody? No. So uh, I, I need to, to clarify then what I mean. So we all know the story of the atomic bombs from great scientists, you know, who were in it also as scientists. They didn't know that Hiroshima, Nagasaki, etc., was going to happen, right? They were technicians. The financial system, it has employed hundreds and hundreds of physicists for their math. The math of physics is very different from the math of economists. Your conventional microeconomist is useless to that kind of financial innovation. These physicists who, you know, the typical physicists that I know, by the time they are 30, they don't know what to do with themselves. So a lot of them, Goldman Sachs, just to mention one financial firm, had over a hundred physicists doing these, these innovation, mathematical innovations. They were not thinking that they were creating uh, instruments for mass destruction, as somebody put it. They were thinking technically. And uh, the other fantastic example, of course, is Napalm. Originally Napalm, you know, Napalm is meant to, the way it was eventually produced, uh, you are in flames, you know what I'm talking about, right? You are in flames and you add water, the typical person who is flames water, and the water activates it even more. That last part was a technical innovation of the back room. So they were struggling on the, to create this phosphorus, this fire, very intense fire. But then they ran into the problem, and we have the transcripts from the Pentagon saying, my God, they just go into the water and it's done, and there's so much water in Vietnam. You can imagine, right? This is the talk in the Pentagon. This is the American Pentagon. And um, they put scientists to work. Let's, and it was a technical problem. Let's enable this napalm to survive water, because there's a lot of water in Vietnam. It became a technical issue. And some scientists were very impressed and proud, I guess, that, you know what, we found an innovation. Now, a lot of the stuff that is happening today is of that nature. It means, that is why I talk about systematicities. It's like a technical problem. The surveillance space is a technical problem. Now you show that slide. This, okay, yeah, these are some numbers. I'm talking about a surveillance space which in the United States is huge. I'm going to show you some figures about the United States. And so we have uh, almost a million people with top security clearance, and many increasing number are uh, private companies. And, uh, and, uh, and these private companies hire, as they might say, talent, which means that they can hire other national, it doesn't have to be a citizen. So there's a kind of interesting denationalizing that also happens there. Now, this is a full-time operation surveillance. Next slide. And here we have, okay, next slide. Can you see this? So these are uh, about 9,000 uh, surveillance stations. They're all over the country. This is what we know. What we don't know is what we don't know. 
as Rumsfeld might have put it. You understand what I'm saying, right? We know that these exist. We don't know how many more there are. Every now and then, something happens that one, oh my God, one discovers certain things. So recently there was a whistleblower who was horrified. He belonged to that surveillance space. He came out and he had, he was in the news for about half an hour and then disappeared again. And he gave us more information about this. But so what I want to pull out is the following. So there is the, the back room, the technical effect. It's a technicality. How do we, you know, these, we're not talking about the kind of the cameras that control traffic or, you know, no, no, no. This is surveying in all aspects of your life. So that whistleblower said over 30 trillion uh, emails have been gathered. Now, I think that they'll never managed to analyze that, and most of it is going to be nonsense. But this is like, a, the technical challenge here is, how can we have full surveillance of everything that those who are not in the surveillance space are doing? Now, most of those who are not in the surveillance space are we the citizens. So this system is there to protect us, the citizens. In order to protect us, they are surveying everything about us. In other words, they reconstitute us as suspect. We're all suspect. Now, whether you are a citizen, a tourist, hey, hey if you enter that other zone, you know, so you're either in that space of surveillance, passively, you know, surveying, or you're outside. And so one question that I have this is another sort of transversal zone that connects us all, really. Uh, is that, are we, we who are the surveyed, we who are suspect for our own good, we're all suspect, are we the new colonials? You know, to talk about national citizenship, and it's tough. So, again, for me, this is very important to communicate in the United States, where you have so many strange nationalists, you know, so many people are nationalists. You know how in the United States, they say, America's the greatest country. I mean, I mean, can you imagine a Dutch, I'm Dutch, a Dutch person saying, the Netherlands is the greatest country. I mean, it just wouldn't cross once, it's just not an option, <laughs> you know, mentally, you would be blocked from thinking that. Most countries in the world that I know, they don't say that. We are, the Americans are continuously saying, we're the greatest, we're the, so, one of my projects is to really communicate this kind of stuff. Now, this is a systematicity. It, it's not just people. We could kill all of the people who are doing it now. The systematicity is still there. The, the positions, the machines, you know, and this is really a sort of an actant network, eh? machines and people, etc. So again, my question then comes, what are the spaces where we can make something, where we are not simply being the surveyed. And back to that global street, that notion of making, of making territory also, it becomes extremely important. Uh, so when the Occupy movement makes territory, it makes territory, which is like a structural hole, in the territory of global finance, which is Wall Street. So you have these multiple, because the territory of, of Wall Street is not simply national US territory, it's a territory of global finance. If you want, you know, one can say that. Um, can we move on? And I want to, that that's the, these are the, these are the counter, I think you just moved it right. This is the counter, um, counter terrorism. That's a different, that's an active intervention. Surveillance is this other zone. Can we move on? Now I want to, yes? Yes, right. So I want to, to, to another one of these powerful systematicities that we're living with. The question of inequality. And I want to capture uh, that inequality is made. It's not just a condition. We experience it as a condition, but it is made. And if it is made, it can be unmade. I should make a big footnote. I do not believe we can live in a, in a society that is fully equal because we have such diversity of elements. So it's, it's a challenge. But do we need this degree of inequality? So for instance, New York City, or all, our, all these global cities, they are machines to make wealth. 
But you know, it's still is a, a story. So in, in 1979, that's the census. In other words, it's usually referred to as the 1980 census. The top 1% of earners in New York City received or grabbed, you choose your term, 12% of all the income generated in New York City. And income here means literally work, huh? the work, it's not capital gains. In 2009, the census that was just done, the top 1% took in of earners, in other words, the salary function, they have other sources of wealth. So the top 1% got 44% of all the income generated in New York City. And so my, and of course, New York City is enormously unequal. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's very problematic huh? in that sense. So, yes, inequality, more inequality, even more inequality, but at some point, we're on the other side of the curve. We're talking about something else. And so one of the, the interpretations that I make of a lot, of whether it is at space of security, this inequality, or the, the question of land grabs in the global south, I just alluded to the Chinese case, is the notion that this epoch that we're living is marked by active expulsions from the system. Not social exclusion, that too. Social exclusion, discrimination, happens inside the system. This is something else. This is your expel. So if I position myself at the edge of the system, that is not the border, eh? not the geographic border, the edge of the system, and I ask, does the system bring in people or move out people? If I look at the Keynesian period, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, in all our sort of Western countries, also Latin America, by the way, the system you saw brought in people, not because it's a nice system but because it needed, because it's mass consumption, mass production, mass building of suburban housing. So people in, people in, people in. Moreover, because it was mass consumption so, so importantly, it meant reasonable wages. So a systematicity that works to produce, you know, a large middle class, etc. Today, I argue, if you stand at that systemic edge, by the way, that systemic edge can be right there in the middle of Wall Street. It does not, it's not the border, I repeat you see that the system expels in many different ways. I talked about the land grabs, China in whatever, um, the security apparatus that sort of, exp the surveillance zone here that expels us a bit from our historic notion of a citizen because we're all suspect. Um, the question of inequality. The question of imprisonment. Last year in the United States, 14 million people had an encounter with prisons. You know, a lot of these people, well, some of the people who are in jail in the United States are honest murderers, they're the real thing, but a lot of them are simply being warehoused. It's one, that's an expulsion too. There's no, there's no future for these people. So, etc. so this, this to me is a very uh, significant thing. Now, I want to illustrate, next slide, this graph, just look at the shape. So this is, more or less 100 years of economic history of the United States as captured by one measure. So it goes from 1917 till really 2009, because this goes on, it's just cut off here. Uh, what does it show? It shows the share of national income appropriated by the top 10% of earners. And so you see there, it was like 47%, you know, and then you have the depression, the first, then it comes sharp down, 1942, the adorable Keynesian decades, government, uh, you know, governs a bit the markets, there is a, this, the system brings in people as consumers, reasonable wages, unions are strong, you know, a, a kind of systematicity. I'm not saying that that's a utopia or ideal, it was a real thing with its imperfections, a lot of discrimination, a lot of racism against women, against whatever. Anyway, and then comes 1987, when this new epoch begins, and it shoots up again. Now, the government played a bit of a role in governing that economy in those Keynesian years. That fall stands for a rise, if you want, of a middle class. Uh, yes, next slide. And this is the, this I just want to point out from 79, again, the last 30 years, 
the top 1% of earners, look how they increase their income by 300%. The bottom 50%, the two bottom lines, barely increased. Now, here the issue of visibility and invisibility, how a system renders invisible a lot of the stuff. So when you read the literature for this period, with some exceptions like myself and others who were saying inequality, inequality, we've been saying that for 25 years, uh, you, it reads like, oh my gosh, these were prosperous years, it was all fantastic, the rebuilding, a lot of gentrification, a lot of rebuilding, a lot of this kind of stuff. And in fact, 50% of the people were out, they got poorer. And that is rendered invisible. And a lot of this economic action happens in cities, which is already a very high visibility space, a lot of rebuilding, homeless, invisible. They are rendered, you know, gentrification expels, I don't need to elaborate that. So th these are very, very problematic uh, trends. And what I'm always, I'm always checking what have the experts of that time said and written? And it's just extraordinary, the lack of distance, the lack of critical distance. Now, next slide. Now, here is very quickly, sort of who are the top 1%, who are the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And just take a glance, because I don't want to dwell on it, but, but uh, there is an enormous amount of people who have very low income in the US. The next one. This is foreclosures. Now, I, am not, I don't have time, but I have all the, the tables. I think they are in the text that was published in the, um, in the report for the conference, the book for the conference, uh, that this is also, of course, happening in, in, uh, in Eastern Central Europe and in Europe, but especially in Eastern Central Europe and in certain parts of Asia. But we're talking millions of households. This is a short, brutal history that begins in 201, takes off incredibly by 204, 205, ends by 207, but the impact continues. It's a certain kind of mortgage, very abusive instrument, um, that finance, it was a financial project, it was not a project of the state. The subprime mortgages have also served in all our countries, basically, uh, to help people, modest people, get a home. That is a state project. This is something else what happened. And now we have 30 million people out of, basically out of their homes. Many of them in tent cities. This is the United States. They are invisible. Many in slab cities. This is in the deserts where you have like old, they bring in old buses, old cars, and then they attach big rocks because the winds in the desert always, you know, take it. I mean, people who are living in tunnels, some of you may have heard this. Now, how was this made? This is made. People, the, the very common explanation, which is a lazy explanation, I mean, it's like you, you don't even try to understand what happened, is the notion that these people who were mostly modest income people, because 70% of the people in the US already have uh, uh, homes, that they were, uh, you know, they were irresponsible. They thought, okay, I can have a house. No, that's not the story. This is a financial story. So, as you know, maybe you don't, but the global GDP in the world, huh, in, in this epoch there, was $54 trillion. That's a lot of zeros, huh? that's like nine zeros. Um, the value of financial assets in this time, you know, in the mid-2000s, etc., is $630 trillion. That's more than 14 times global GDP. Those high-level investors, they're not stupid. They thought, my God, this is really getting out of hand. Financial assets, by the way, are mostly, were mostly immaterial, speculative huh? stuff. You can't have that growth curve without speculation. And, um, and so they began to be interested in what they called asset-backed securities. This, by the way, is happening now the most acute case in Central Eastern Europe is Hungary, where you have over a million people, households, which means more people, that have been foreclosed. I know it is happening a bit in Bosnia because somebody was telling me. I don't know what's happening here, but... So, so what's the point here? The point is that these high-level investors say, give me an asset, something material, an asset-backed security. So what this meant for the, for the financial services who were innovating, they had to get 
500 contracts in a period of a week to produce a certain kind of instrument. They went to these and said, they ran them down their throats. In six years, they got, it's like sign, all that mattered was the contract, the value of the house, whether the people could pay their mortgages, didn't matter at all. They just needed the contract that said, here's a house. You know, a house backing the instrument. And they literally said, so 15 million of these contracts were extracted. Now, nine million plus are out of those homes. Again, short, brutal history. And another six million, the data just came out, are going to be foreclosed. I am Dutch. The total population of my country is 15 million to 16 million. If I try to make a Pythagorean number out of these millions, because remember, a household can be one person, two, three, five, you know, it's more. So we're talking about 30 million people. It would be like evicting the whole of the Netherlands, the whole population of the Netherlands out, and then again, or find another country that has 16 million. These are enormous figures. And the system is such that it succeeds in making that invisible. They're out. They're out in ten cities, they're out in poorer housing, they're out doubling up with family, but they're sort of out. Now, that's an extraordinary systemic capacity to make invisible all the, the tragedies that it is made. Now, I have to wrap up. So, next slide, I think I'm ending with this one. Can people see? Dead cities. Uh, this is a Chinese, uh, Chinese um, uh, artist. I'm going to end with... Um, Ah, there you see it a bit better. Those are all real buildings, by the way, that were built by fancy architects in Shanghai, you know, the 5,000 high-rise buildings in seven years. Um, and so he got sick of it, and he said, let me, you know, create a bit of a collage here. So, so these, these super powerful systematicities that have a capacity for destruction <laughs> of lives, of life projects, of neighborhoods, of this is, these are the, this is the setting within which I search for this space, which is a rough space for making, and within which I see the Occupy movement and a whole series of other uh, civil society initiatives as enormously significant. Now remember what I said about uh, the, the we the illegal cleaners, the illegal immigrant cleaners point in a trajectory. Um, when you think about how the powerless have made history, sometimes powerlessness can become complex. And you, they make history, or the powerless make history, but they do not necessarily become empowered. So that the conventional minds or categories don't capture that. That making of history also becomes invisible. Uh, one issue for me that is very important is, is the fact that um, that the powerful make history in brutal and short periods. The United States bombs Iraq six weeks, thinks it controls Iraq, and then begins that other war, uh, which is still going on, really, which moves to the cities partly. And, and uh, so, so this, but the powerless make history often with multiple generations. It takes time. It's another kind of dimension. But what I'm interested in then in this setting is the global street as a space for making and as a space for making history, the making of histories. And I think I have some slides here. Just I want to next see if I have if I have that right. Yes? Oh you know but let's move on from finance. Out out finance is more finance. Yes? Yes. Urban capabilities. This notion that there is something about the city unlike a plantation where this making of histories, making of the political on the part of the powerless, is actually a possibility. And I wanted, do I have my, and here more and more, yeah, let's go, yeah, yeah, oh my God, where is it, yes, yeah, yeah. So this is also an image. Now, these people are in reality not all so tall and slender, huh? it's a distortion, 
it's a destroyer that looks beautiful, sort of stylized. Uh, but here, the, the, you know, this is clearly Tahrir Square. People without arms, just their bodies, just their presence, tanks, they recode, they unsettle the meaning of tense. Next slide. It's more of this. Next slide. Here, the tanks, they have been destabilized. The meaning of tanks is destabilized. When you see praying, etc., you know, the, the, and then final slide, I think I have another one or not. No, this is the last one, I think. Okay, we can end with this. So, so this notion of the city and urban capabilities, a mix of the space of the city, the territory that is the city, and the people. You know, these are for me elements. This is just one element, there are others, but elements in a sort of a counter hegemonic project that is deeply a people's project, that is deeply a project of masses of people, but that has to have in it what I see in the Occupy movement, which is a real contestation of power, of existing forms of power, of existing forms of control, etc., and, and which is not necessarily focused on grabbing power. And that, to me, makes a difference. Many critique that, but that means that it is open source. Everybody can come in. When it becomes a project of grabbing power, it's a far more focused project. And it sort of you know, ultimately might be less critical because so you grab power, power is a mate systematicity. You want to grab that systematicity? No. And so it is like a beginning that is amorphous, that is without a shape, but that is open, that keeps on bringing in more people and that whose agenda is not fully defined because the histories and the geographies of different places in the world, you cannot reduce it to one program. I think that has to come many different... I have just focused on big cities in, in a way in what I'm talking about, but there are so many other kinds of localities. So, again, that notion of urban capabilities, of global street, and of the spaces and the instruments with which the powerless make histories and in that making of histories, their powerlessness becomes complex, even though they do not necessarily get empowered. That in-between zone between being powerless and empowered. Empowered is great, but it's rare. And there's a whole zone here in the shadow of both the powerlessness and empowerment that I think is what this uh, Occupy movement and these struggles today in their amorphousness, in a way, what this is about. Thank you very much.